Hello everyone and welcome to this video podcast for evolution and diversity. In the past several podcasts, we've talked about what is life, what is life made of, and then in the last one we talked about where did life start. And now what we're interested in is how did all that diversity that we see on earth come about? And it came about due to the theory of evolution. So for today we have an introduction to evolution. We're going to talk about Darwin and Wallace, and we'll also spend some time talking about the history of the nature of life. We'll spend some time talking about the evidence of evolution by natural selection. We'll define evolution formally, and then we'll list the processes that can cause evolutionary change. Just introduce these, and we'll come back to them later. And then we'll explain the process of evolution. So let's go ahead and get started with our first topic. So we're going to talk about Darwin and Wallace, but to get there, let's talk about the nature of species. And what did previous people, before Darwin and Wallace, what did they think about the nature of species? And this won't be a complete list, but it's a a good starting point. So we'll start with Plato, my good friend from high school. And this was about 2,400 years ago. And he believed that every species was a perfect essence of themselves. So he would put humans in a box all to themselves, fish, for instance, plants, a dog, and maybe an invertebrate like a worm. And of course, there are many other species than what I'm showing here. He would have argued that all of these different organisms existed perfectly as themselves with no change. They never changed. And this kind of thinking was called typological. Because every species was its own type. No change. Let's put that over here. It was static. No change. Then one of his students, Aristotle, came along. He still believed in the typological thinking. But he believed in this great chain of being, so to speak. Where there was a sequence of increasing, where there was this sequence of increasing size and complexity. So humans, say we'll use the same ones we have above here, humans, dog, fish, worm, plant. And they still existed in their own types, so to speak, but there was increasing size and complexity but it was still typological. Now Aristotle's thinking of the great chain of being existed for 20 centuries. That's a long time. However, over time it started to break down a little bit. And so now I wanna talk with you about someone else who started to understand how there had to be something more to it than just this. And that individual was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And this was about 1809. He proposed a formal thinking of evolution. And the big thing that he introduced here is that indeed there were different types of species and organisms. So he would have still said we had humans, of course, and then we'll put these all in the same line here. But the big thing he said is that they don't exist in their own little boxes, but rather they aren't in this perfect essence, that they are not static. They change. However, he still believed that evolution, he would have said that evolution is progressive in producing larger and more complex species. He also believed in something that we call the inheritance of acquired traits. And the classic example of this is thinking about the length of a giraffe's neck. And so if there were a, say, tree here, and the giraffe needed to eat the leaves from that tree to survive, well, maybe its neck had to be this long. Don't worry, I'm not gonna attempt to draw a giraffe. But what happened then if the tree grew? And now there were new species of tree that existed where the leaves were higher up. Well, a giraffe with this length of a neck is never gonna be able to get those leaves 
So it would stretch over time and stretch its neck. And by gaining the ability to stretch its neck and have a longer neck, it could pass that trait on to its offsprings. But it was something that the giraffe was intentionally doing to produce a longer neck. And once it did that, it could pass that on to its offspring. We now largely accept this idea to be false, that the inheritance of acquired traits is not supported. So now let's bring on Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. They countered the idea that traits were progressive, that new traits or new species did not necessarily have to be bigger and more complex. And to be fair, Lamarck also began to accept this over time. They proposed that that change in traits, change through time, occurs because traits vary in a population. That is, some individuals with certain traits produce more offspring. And so a, a, a big difference in what Darwin and Wallace were proposing here is that variation in a population is key to understanding the nature of species. Previous to this, in the typological teachings, variation occurred and it was seen, but it was unimportant. So this new thinking that replaces typological thinking, we call population thinking. We often hear that the theory of evolution was revolutionary, and in many ways it was. And so let's point out three reasons why we often think of it as being a revolutionary idea. And I think the first reason, and, and maybe the most revolutionary, is that it overturned the idea that species are static and unchanging. Remember that there had been 20 centuries of thinking that species were static and did not change. So this was a big, big thing. It replaced topological thinking and replaced it with the population thinking, thinking about the variation within that population. So related to this is that variation matters. The last idea that really set this apart from previous ideas of the nature of species is that it was scientific. That is, it proposed a mechanism that explained change through time. And most importantly, it proposed predictions that could be tested. So now let's move on to the second objective to talk about the categories of evidence for evolution. So in this second objective, we're going to talk about the evidence that supports evolution by natural selection. And it's probably a good idea to remind ourselves what that definition of natural selection is. It's the process whereby organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. So thinking about natural selection, we could make two predictions. The first is that species change through time. Those with better adaptations survive and make new progeny. And so those new progeny, more of them will have this new adaptation. The second prediction is that species are related by a common ancestor. 
if one species replaces the other species because it's better adapted, but they came from the same population, then they should be related. And so I'm going to go over eight pieces of evidence to support these two predictions. So the first five pieces of evidence are going to be related to this first prediction, that species change through time. And the first piece of evidence relates to geologic time. It has been shown through various geological studies that the geologic time of Earth is vast, 4.5 billion years. And by studying rocks at different times, we can tell a lot about what happened at that particular time. Your book has a good picture of this, but I'm just going to draw kind of a mountain here. And so we can take sedimentary rocks from different parts of this mountain, and they existed at different times. And so we know here at the bottom, this represents about 510 million years ago. Here, let's say it represents about 280 million years ago, and maybe close to that, about 275 million years ago. Now, if species change through time, we would expect to see evidence of that at each of these milestones, and we do. We see at about the 510 million years ago, we see trilobites. These are now extinct, but we see a lot of evidence that they existed around this time period, but we don't see them anymore. Around 280 million years ago, we see ferns, a type of plant. And about 275 million years ago, we see footprints from an animal that we would describe as a mammal-like reptile. So we can see that species change over time, and we gain species over time by studying where we see the fossils at a particular geological time. The second piece of evidence, extinctions, change species over time. In, in the early 1800s, scientists found species, lots of species, in the fossil record that didn't exist anymore. And over time, it became clear that we were never going to find those species existing on Earth. So those species we determined to be extinct. For instance, we see records of trilobites here. We don't see them anymore. These mammal-like reptiles, we don't see them anymore. They are extinct. Woolly mammoths, we don't see them anymore because they're extinct. So if species have gone extinct over time, that means that Earth's species have changed over time. The third is that transitional features link older and younger species. So before Darwin and Wallace published their works, researchers found features in extinct species similar to living species. There's many examples of this, but one would be the giant South American sloth and how it is no longer alive anymore, that it is extinct, but is it strikingly similar to the existing sloths found in South America. So this is evidence that species change throughout time. So Darwin proposed that extinct species are related to living species. I'm going to erase this last part so I have room to draw something here. We also see what we would call transitional features. A good example of this is that we see fins as a fish, and then with animals that walk on two or four legs, they have, of course, legs. We didn't just go magically from finned species to leg species. Rather, we went through several transitional forms. That shared features of fins and legs. On this end, the features would have been more like fins. On this end, they would have begun to look more like legs. Remember that these kinds of changes are not goal-oriented. It's not like a fish said, you know what, I'd really like to go on land, so it had the goal of developing legs. That's not how it works. It's about fitness, and it's about natural selection. You had fins, but there was a distinct advantage for some populations to slowly develop and select for features that resembled legs. Hey, let's go to the fourth piece of evidence. 
and that is that we see vestigial traits. We can think of a vestigial trait as a reduced or incompletely developed structure that has no function but is similar to functional structures in an ancestral or closely related species. And a few examples of this are, is that some snakes have tiny hip bones, but they don't function in movement. Over time, they may lose those hip bones. Ostriches and kiwis, the bird kiwi, not the fruit kiwi, have wings. However, ostriches and kiwis, they don't fly. There are blind, cave-dwelling fish with eye sockets, but no eyes because they don't see, they're blind. Humans have a tailbone, while other animals like monkeys have a tail. Our tailbone doesn't have any function. It doesn't help us in our balance, it doesn't help us hang from trees. It would be fun, but it doesn't help us do that. It's a vestigial structure. Let's move on to our fifth piece of evidence. And that is that species are changing today. So under our very own eyes, we see evidence of this. For instance, antibiotic resistant bacteria. These change over time to form new species. Finches. We see change through time in finches. Primarily when we think about or study their beaks and the size of their beaks. So these are the five pieces of evidence that support that species change through time. Now let's think about the other prediction of evolution by natural selection, and that is evidence of descent from a common ancestor. And I'm gonna talk about three pieces of evidence here. The first one, which I'm gonna label six because it's the sixth one of the overall evidence. We see similar species in the same geographical area. So it turns out that Darwin was a scientist, a researcher on the HMS Beagle. And the goal of the Beagle was to map the coast of South America as shown here. And Darwin, as the naturalist on the, on the ship, he collected species, many different species along the coast of South America as it moved all around the continent. And he also collected from islands nearby. And, and the famous one he collected from was the Galapagos Islands. And while he collected many species, the ones that often get thought of are the finch species that he collected and the mockingbird species. And the Galapagos I'm not sure if we can see them in this picture, but let's just say they're here. There's a series of islands. It's not just one landmass. It's several islands there. And what they discovered was that the finch species that were found on the continent, the main continent, were similar to the species on the islands, but there were very distinguishable differences, particularly in the size of their beaks, their colorations, and so forth. So much so that they said that they were different species. And so Darwin, from these observations, claimed that finches from South America, that is the main landmass of South America, were the common ancestors to finches found on islands. So the finches on the main continent of South America somehow got isolated, maybe by wind, maybe by floating masses that, that moved them there, not exactly sure how they got to the islands, but once they got on the island, because they were isolated from the other species on the main continent, they went through a process of natural selection because that island had different resources. So they had to adapt to eating different food, finding food in different places, and so eventually over time, they became a different species. 
And now we know, because we can now look at DNA evidence and compare these different finches from the islands of Galapagos or mainland South America. And we can see by DNA evidence that indeed these are different species. Similar but different. The seventh piece of evidence is that something we call homology. And homology is a similarity that exists in species due to a common ancestry. An example would be human hair and dog fur. We both have this hair-like structure, so we'll put dogs here and humans here. And we have hair because of a common species here that had hair that led to dogs and humans, but did not lead to hair on animals like reptiles, because reptiles don't share this common ancestor as dogs and humans do. Another really good example of homology that we see is in the limbs of animals. So if you look at this picture here, and there's a similar one in your book, we can see that the limb structure found in humans, cats, whales, and bats, and we could have other animals on here as well, is very similar, but they have a different function. So we see that all of these from a human have phalanges, and so do whales. They're a different length, but they are homologous. Same thing with the humors different sizes in these three different kinds of animals, but they're homologous in structure. So this is a great example of evidence of descent from a common ancestor because we see these four animals here with strikingly similar limbs in structure, but they have a different function. Okay, I'd like to move to the eighth and final piece of evidence, and that is we see the formation of new species today. Two good examples of this are, we see new species of finch on the Galapagos Island. Due to the changing environment and changing food availability, new finch species have been found. The other is quite interesting, and that is we're seeing that killer whales, orcas, have changed their prey choice and social behavior to such an extent that the two populations of killer whales no longer interbreed. Okay, so let's move to our third objective, and that is to define evolution. And we've defined this before, but let's define it again. So the definition of evolution is that it is a change in the allele frequencies of a population over time. And remember, as we defined before, an allele is one of several variations of a gene. So let's say in a population of tigers, we have orange tigers, orange and black tigers. But every now and then you see a white tiger. Now if you looked at all the leos in this population and made a pie graph of sorts here, where the orange represents orange alleles in that population, and this white little slice of the pie graph here represents the white fur color allele. So while in this particular time frame, the orange alleles that make orange tigers is the most predominant allele, and the white allele is less in percentage. Now who knows, over time, this may change. Maybe over time, we begin to see more white tigers, and the prediction then would be there would be more white fur color alleles in the population. Why that would happen, we could only guess, but maybe something in the environment changes that makes the white tiger more likely to mate than the orange tiger. So evolution is a change in allele frequencies over time. Okay, let's move on to our fourth objective. And this objective asks us to describe the processes that can cause evolutionary change. And I'm gonna first just begin by listing the different processes. The first is mutation. The second is something we call genetic drift. The third is something we would call migration. And the fourth is natural selection. And we'll spend more time with each of these later on, but just real briefly, mutation are random changes in DNA sequence. And this is important because having random mutations allows to have that variation within a population. 
it allows you to have some orange tigers and some white tigers. And this, of, of the four, this one is completely random. And it is important, as I said, to establish that variation within the population. So genetic drift is variation of alleles in a population due to the chance disappearance particular alleles as individuals die or don't reproduce. So things like natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, fires, they can remove a portion of the population. And when you remove that portion of the population, you will change the variation of alleles. You will change the proportion of certain alleles in that population because those individuals have died off. Migration occurs when you have a population, say, here at point A, and there's a new population here, say point B, wouldn't have to be, but maybe there's some structure in between them, maybe a mountain, maybe a, a large river between them, something that would not normally allow these populations to interact. But let's say a portion of this population, for whatever reason, migrated over here. As it migrated over here and began to interbreed with members of the B population, this will lead to a change in allele frequencies in population B because you've just introduced new alleles to population B. Okay, the fourth one, natural selection, we just spent a lot of time talking about it, so I'm not gonna spend a lot more time right now, but just to remind you, this is when there is a reproductive advantage for some individuals with certain traits. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our fifth and final objective. So in this objective, we're gonna talk about the process of natural selection. We've already defined natural selection. We talked about the predictions of natural selection and the evidence to support natural selection. But I think it's important for us to spend a little time talking about the process of natural selection. All right, so to explain the process of natural selection, Darwin came up with four postulates that would provide a logical explanation of natural selection. So his four postulates were as follows. Variation exists among individuals that make up a population. The second one is that some of the trait differences are heritable. The third is that survival and reproductive success are highly variable. And his fourth postulate is that the subset of individuals that survive best and produce the most offspring is not a random sample. So some key words in these four populations that we're going to focus on as we describe them is variation, heritable, when we talk about reproductive success, and that the whole thing is not a random sample. There's a reason it occurs. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about each of these, and I'm going to begin with the first one. And in talking about these four postulates, let's think about a population of beetles. And this first one talks about the variation that exists in this population of beetles. And so I'm just gonna draw the beetles as this circle here. And within this population, for reasons we don't quite know yet, there's just more red beetles. However, there is variation. So we do see some blue beetles and we see some green beetles. So this variation exists in a population and every population is like this. They're not all going to look the same. I should also mention that when I'm talking about variation, in this example, I'm talking about the color of the, the beetles, but variation exists in many other ways. It could be a physiological variation, it could be a size variation, it could be some kind of behavioral variation, it could be something we could see with our eyes, it might be something completely cellular and we don't even see it. But there is some kind of variation in every population. 
And that's what we see here in the Beatles. So now let's talk about the second postulate. And what we mean by this is that the traits of these Beatles are determined by the genes that they have. And the reason we see variation within this population is because this population has multiple alleles in it. And to make this a little bit more simple, let's just say that red beetles are produced because they have two red alleles, which I'm just gonna signify this way. And let's say that the blue beetles are blue because they have two blue alleles. It's the same gene, remember, that gives the color to the beetles. It's just that there's different versions of them, a red allele and a blue allele. And likewise, let's just say that the green beetles have these two different alleles that are capable of producing the green color. Now I say this is simplistic because when you move into genetics, you're going to learn a lot more about alleles and, and why certain traits are more dominant than other traits. But for now, we're gonna keep it simple here and just say we have these alleles that produce red, blue, and green beetles. So when we say it's heritable, we say it's on these alleles. So when this beetle and say this beetle here reproduce and they produce two new beetles or maybe three beetles or four beetles, I'm not sure how many they're gonna produce, but those beetles inherit the red allele, so they're going to be red. When the blue beetles mate, they will produce progeny that have blue alleles. So now do all of these beetles now have a different reproductive success? And that's going to take us to the third postulate. All right, so the third postulate talks about reproductive success and how it's variable. And so what we're saying here in this example, and we're not saying why yet, we're just saying that in this example here, the red beetles survive better and because of that they have a higher reproductive success. In this population you're more likely to see red beetles because they're better at surviving and reproducing. And another way of saying that, to bring back a term from day two I believe, the red beetles have greater fitness. And as we talked about on day two when we introduced this term, that doesn't mean the red beetles are stronger, it doesn't mean the red beetles are faster, it doesn't mean anything about their overall strength. All it means is that they're better at surviving and reproducing. And because of that, we have more red beetles. So let's talk about this fourth postulate. And that is that the subset of individuals that survive best and produce more offspring is not a random sample. Because it might be tempting to say that since this population in one generation has more red beetles, then in the next generation, it will obviously have more red beetles because there's just more of them to begin with. But that's not how this works. Turns out that the red beetles must have some kind of adaptation that makes them better at surviving and producing offspring. We don't know what that adaptation is, but we do know that whatever it is, it allows them to survive and reproduce better. Maybe the red beetles don't taste very good. When a bird comes along or another predator comes along and eats them, they taste bitter or maybe they're poisonous. And so birds learn, don't eat the red ones because it might kill you. It could be that the environment is such that the red beetle color helps them hide from the predators and the green and the blue ones stick out and they're easier for predators to find. And maybe the green and blue ones taste good, right? They're tasty beetles and so the predators really like them. But whatever that adaptation is, it benefits the red beetles so they can produce more offspring and survive better. Now that doesn't mean that in 20 generations, 50 generations, 100 generations, that this population will still be predominantly red beetles. Because remember those processes that can cause evol evolutionary change, mutations, genetic drift, migration, and natural selection can change the allele frequency in this population and lead to evolution. So for instance, let's say due to some kind of mutation, we now produce an orange beetle. And this orange beetle, for whatever reason, has adaptations that make it even better at surviving and reproducing than the red beetles. And so over time, generations and generations, maybe we end up with more and more orange beetles. And we end up with fewer and fewer red beetles. Because of mutations, we're generating new alleles and that can cause evolution. Okay, that's all I have for this video podcast. In this podcast, remember, we talked about the history of the ideas of what people view, of how people viewed the nature of species. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about Darwin and Wallace. And we talked about how they came up with these two predictions of natural selection. And then we talked about the evidence that supported 
evolution by natural selection. We gave a formal definition of evolution, and then we talked about the four processes that can cause evolutionary change. Mutation, natural selection, migration, and genetic drift. We then talked about the four postulates of Darwin that provides a logical explanation of how natural selection can work. Over the next couple of days of material, we're going to talk about different kinds of patterns of selections and other mechanisms of evolution. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you ask me. If not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.